now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a student and a job advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Is this uh, uh, room number 26? Yes, that's right. So, is this the student job centre? It certainly is. How can I help you? Well... Actually, I'm looking for a job, mm -hmm. a part-time job. Do you have anything available at the moment? Uh, yes. Are you a registered student? I'm afraid this service is only available to full-time students. Yes, I am. I'm doing a degree in business studies. Here's my student card. Which year are you in? Well, I've been at uni for four years, but I'm in the third year because I took last year off. Right. Well... Let's just have a look at what positions are available at the moment. Uh, there's a job working at the reception desk at the sports centre for three evenings a week. That's Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. Oh, that sounds like fun, but unfortunately I have evening lectures, so mm. that's not possible, I'm afraid. Is there anything during the day? OK, that's no good then. Um, what about cleaning? There's a position for a cleaner at the childcare centre. Right. But you'd need to be there at 6am. Does that appeal? Six o'clock in the morning? Oh, that's far too early for me, I'm afraid. I'd, I'd never make it that early in the morning. Hmm. Well, there was a position going in the computer lab for three days a week that might be OK. Ah, here it is. No, it's in the library, not the lab. A uh, clerical assistant required. I think it mostly involves putting the books back on the shelves. Oh, no. Hang on. It's for Wednesday and Friday evenings again. No, I can't manage that because of the lectures. <laughs> OK, I'm getting the idea. Uh, look, I'll just get a few details from you anyway, and then we can check through the list and see what comes up. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. We'll fill in the personal details on this application form first, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Now, what's your name again? Anita Newman. Uh, that's N-E-W-M-A-N. And your address, Anita? I'm in one of the halls of residence for postgraduate students. You know, International House. OK, that's easy. Uh, what's your room number there? Room B569. Uh, no, sorry, B659. I always get that wrong. <laughs> I haven't been living there very long. Do you have any other skills, typing, languages, that sort of thing? Well, I, I speak some Japanese. Right, I'll make a note of that. Now, let's see what else is available. Uh, what do you think of administrative work? There's a position for uh, an office assistant at the English Language Centre. Hmm, that sounds interesting. It's for three days a week, Monday, Friday and Saturday mornings. Interested? Oh, I was hoping to have Saturdays free, but I need the work, so... Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me what the job involves? Yeah, sure. It says here that you'll be required to deal with student inquiries and answer the phone. Oh, 
I'm sure I can handle all that without a problem. Great. Well, would you like me to arrange an interview for you, say, Friday morning around ten? Oh, uh, can we make it a bit later? Unfortunately, I've got something to do at ten. Would that be OK? Not a problem. How about 11.30? Hmm. Hope it works out for you, Anita. Me too. And thanks for all your help. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a talk on local radio about a children's theme park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. For the second in our series about locally run businesses, we meet Simon Winridge, co-founder of the hugely successful Winridge Forest Railway Park. Welcome, Simon. Now, perhaps you can begin by telling us a little bit about how it all started. Well... During the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but we didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway, and we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month, because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> I dealt with park business and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife, and by making cuttings through the rock. Uh, nowadays, we're open all year round and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area, with 50,000 visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things. 
keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park and makes sure the visitors are kept fed and watered, which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. So have you finished your development of the site for the moment? Not at all. We're constantly looking for ways to offer more to our visitors. Mm -hmm. The railway remains the central feature, and there's now 1.2 kilometres of the line laid, but we'd like to lay more. Because of the geology of the area, our greatest problem is digging tunnels, but we're gradually overcoming that. We're also very pleased with a new installation of the go-kart arena which is 120 square metres in area. Oh. Again, the problem is the geology. We had to level the mounds on the track for safety reasons. We wanted to enable 5 to 12-year-olds to use the go-karts. And the main attraction here is the Formula One kart. We've known fights to break out over who gets it. <laughs> and then, finally, to our most recent development, which is the landscape swimming pool. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students called Karen and Dave discussing the assignment for their biology class. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi Dave. As you know, I've asked you to come here today to discuss the assignment for our biology class. We must decide what we should do about this very important research work. The whale survey. Yeah, I was also hoping to share some ideas with you. So let's start. OK. I've dug into some journal articles to see what sort of questions we should consider. Most of them include watching time and strongly urge it to be the top concern. What do you say? Yeah, the watching time should be carefully chosen, since I've heard a lot of unnecessary failures concerning picking the wrong time when it all went stormy and murky, and then nothing was seen during the whole field trip. I mean, they could have avoided that easily. Right. Then we should also pay close attention to the sea's surface, because no one wants to encounter the failures you just mentioned. I think we'd better hope for the best, that it will be calm, with no choppy status. What about the weather conditions? That definitely should be taken into account, as it correlates with all the former factors. Most important of all, as a sighting is made, position and environmental parameters are recorded on standardised sighting pro formats, including time, visibility, position of the ship, using a global positioning system, wind speed, and wind direction. Shouldn't there be a set limit for the visibility level, say 50 metres? Cetaceans are really sensitive to sound. They are able to know that something's coming after them, so they would hide in order to avoid possible danger. So let's make it 100 metres, shall we? Yeah, that might be better. Oh, in that case, we'd also need to pay attention to the appearance of the fishing boats, you know, for all the noise that they would make. That's right. 
Although observations were regularly made, we know very little about whale vocalization and how they use sound in their behavioral and social interactions. So to understand marine mammals' social interactions, we'll need to use passive acoustic recordings to track and assess the individual behaviors of whales, as well as to identify their appearance. Okay, then what about scales? Oh, for each sighting, the number of animals should be counted. The group size, I mean. Also, we need to identify the species, possible age, and sex of the individuals. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Speaking of identifying species, we need to find out the unique physical features of each whale. Let's start with the sperm whale. The sperm whale is the largest toothed whale, yet it's only a quarter of that of the blue whale. Its unique body is unlikely to be confused with any other species, and that distinctive shape comes from its very large, block-shaped head, which can be one quarter to one third of its length. The sperm whale's flukes are triangular and very thick. It has a series of little bumps on the back of its fluke instead of having a dorsal fin. The largest bump is called the hump by whalers and can be mistaken for a dorsal fin because of its shape and size. Then there is the northern right whale. Right whales have round bodies with arching rostrums, V-shaped blowholes and dark grey or black skin. The most distinguishing feature of a right whale is the rough patches of skin on its head, which appear white due to parasitism by whale lice. It has no back fins at all. The blue whale's body can be various shades of bluish grey dorsally and somewhat lighter underneath. It has a long, tapering body that appears stretched in comparison to the stockier build of other whales. The head is flat, U-shaped, and has a prominent ridge running from the blowhole to the top of its upper lip. Lastly are the mink whales. They are the second smallest baleen whale. The mink whale is black, grey or purple in colour. Common mink whales are distinguished from other whales by a white band they have on each flipper. Their long back and tiny dorsal fin, two thirds of the way down their back, is quite distinctive. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about the biography of Samuel Cunard and his shipping company. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, class. In the last few lectures, I've talked about the history of technology in the business area. But today, I want to use Samuel Cunard as our case study, who was a shipping magnate that founded the Cunard Line. 
Now, Cunard was born in Canada. When he first left home, he was still a teenager. Then he came into a US company as a worker and learned how to sail there. During the War of 1812, Cunard volunteered for service in the 2nd Battalion of the Halifax Regiment Militia and rose to the rank of captain. He held many public offices, such as volunteer fireman and lighthouse commissioner, and maintained a reputation as not only a shrewd businessman, but also an honest and generous citizen. When he went to England, his friends cooperated with him, and together they coined a shipping company. The company had instant wealth and could deal with more than one cargo, for its major business was in North America and the Atlantic. From then onwards, Cunard became a highly successful entrepreneur in British shipping and one of a group of 12 individuals who dominated the affairs of England. In 1838, the British government, impressed by the advantages of steam sailing for making regular passages, invited tenders to carry the transatlantic mails by steamer. Back then, mail contact through steamships brought more punctuality, while other types of ships were always delayed. The journey times were flexible, with a transatlantic crossing lasting for six weeks and with no fixed times of departure or arrival. So it was never known when the mail would arrive, or, since so many sailing ships foundered, whether it would arrive at all. What Cunard wanted, in line with the thrusting new technology of the Victorian age, was a maritime extension of the brand, new timetabled railways on land. Cunard's experience in steamship operation, with observations of the growing railway network in England, encouraged him to explore the creation of a transatlantic fleet of steamships, which would cross the ocean as regularly as trains crossed land, and that's why he went to the United Kingdom seeking investors in 1837. He set up a company with several other businessmen to bid for the rights to run a transatlantic mail service between the UK and North America for £55,000 annually for 10 years. The bid was successful. Almost at the same time, Cunard cooperated with an English businessman and established the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, the ancestor of the Cunard line. In 1840, the company's first steamship sailed from Liverpool to Boston, Massachusetts, with Cunard and 63 other passengers on board, marking the beginning of regular passenger and cargo service. Establishing a long, unblenished reputation for speed and safety, Cunard's company made ocean liners a success in the face of many potential rivals who lost ships and fortunes. Cunard's ships proved successful, and he then opened many branches, but the high cost saddled Cunard with heavy debts by 1842, so some of them went bankrupt. But what Cunard needed then was a port. After a lot of consideration, he finally opted for Boston because he was very familiar with this city where he had once worked it. Fortunately, by 1843, Cunard ships were earning enough to pay off his debts and begin issuing modest but growing dividends. But the city did more than give Cunard silverware. Winters can be tough here in Boston. For example, in the year of 1844, one ship sank because of the winter freeze. The ship hit icebergs and caused a heavy loss to the company. Then, the board recommended the company to move to New York, and it was a huge success, and then became one of the biggest US shipping companies. Cunard himself made safety his priority, and to this day, Cunard has never been responsible for the loss of a single passenger or a single mailbag on the Atlantic run. Cunard's conservative nature enabled his company to see off rivals and to take a measured and steady approach when it came to the introduction of new technology like radio communication. In the early years of his career, Cunard took a prominent part in community activities, and various charitable organisations, as well as mercantile affairs which extended throughout the Atlantic provinces. Back then, there were hardly any entertainment facilities on board. In order to make sure that the passengers could have a comfortable journey, newspapers were printed on board. Cunard was gratefully remembered for employing his capital in shipbuilding activities in the hard times of the 1830s because this enterprise had circulated money where there would otherwise be poverty and stagnation. His competitiveness and his obsession not to waste time were important characteristics of his personality. Prior to 1912, the shipping line had focused on speed and soon was renowned for its velocity and safety. Although early in life Cunard was imperious, 
he learned diplomacy and became a skillful and persuasive negotiator. His contemporaries admired him for the contribution to transatlantic communication by the line popularly called by his name. After that, for affluent transatlantic passengers, Cunard brought new levels of luxury to ocean travel, lavish suites, a swimming pool, gymnasium, ballroom, electricity and more, just like that of luxurious hotels. OK, so does anyone have any... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. IELTS Reading Tips and Tricks Before the test, develop your vocabulary. This is crucial as the test often uses synonyms and paraphrases. Read widely on varied topics and practice vocabulary exercises. Practice different reading materials, get comfortable with academic texts, scientific articles, and other non-fiction genres similar to those found in the test. Understand question types. Familiarize yourself with the different question formats like true-false not given, matching headings, sentence completion, etc. Practice using them with sample passages. Time management. Practice completing passages and answering questions within the allocated time for each section. Develop time management strategies. During the test, read questions before the passage, understand what information you're looking for before diving into the text. Highlight keywords in questions. Skimming and scanning, don't read everything word for word. Skim for the main idea and scan for specific information based on the questions. Identify key vocabulary, underline important words and phrases in the passage that relate to the questions. Pay attention to synonyms and paraphrases. Don't get stuck, if you can't find the answer quickly, move on and come back later if time allows. Guess wisely if unsure. Answer every question, even if you're unsure, make an educated guess. Leaving questions blank penalizes you. Check your answers, review your answers before submitting, but don't spend too much time second guessing yourself. Additional tips. Stay calm and focused, manage your stress and anxiety to avoid mental blocks. Deep breaths and positive self-talk can help. Practice regularly, take mock tests under timed conditions to simulate the real test experience. Use official resources, utilize official IELTS materials like practice tests and sample papers. Consider professional guidance.